Hello everyone, my name is John Keith and I'm going to talk to you about the role of a judge. I'm a judge in a specialist kind of court called a tribunal, one of which focuses on immigration and asylum cases. And I also sit in a separate tribunal which considers appeals relating to employment law. I'm privileged to hold these positions because I know the impact that the decisions taken by colleagues and I have on our fellow citizens and the trust that is placed in us to make those decisions. In terms of their importance, the decisions can literally be life affecting. The tribunal in which I sit, mainly the Immigration and Asylum Chamber, Upper Tribunal, hears appeals relating to those claiming fears of persecution, serious harm or even death, and also the desire of families to either remain uh, united together or to be reunited. Balanced against those are the needs we have to consider of wider public issues as expressed through the people who make the law, such as the need for immigration control and the public interest in deporting particular individuals, such as foreign criminals, subject to important legal safeguards. I'm based in a building called Field House in central London. And you can see a photograph of that building on the slide. It's just behind the Royal Courts of Justice in central London, although there are similar tribunals across the country. Now, I want you to have a look at the next four photographs and ask yourself the question, which one of these people is a judge? What do you think? Well, the answer is that they could all be judges and not just the obviously dressed person in the bottom right hand corner. Many judges don't wear wigs or gowns and hearings, and I certainly don't. My colleagues are genuinely from all backgrounds and all walks of life, and there have been real changes over the last few years in terms particularly of diversity with more balance in terms of gender and ethnicity. This isn't to say that there isn't more to be done, but it is fair to say that the judiciary is genuinely far more diverse than in the recent past. So in terms of myth busting, my main message to you is that real judges are increasingly reflective of the society in which we live with all of its diversity and different experiences. And that's particularly important in the context of judicial independence, because if judges are only drawn from one narrow social group or background, that can affect their ability, however hard they try, to fulfil their roles. Now, for those of you who are history buffs, you may recall a document called Magna Carta that established nearly a thousand years ago that there were limits on what a king or a queen could do. We have a more recent idea called the separation of powers. When I say recent, the idea is still over 200 years old, but it reflects how people thought that society should work after it was agreed that kings and queens should no longer decide everything for us. The idea is that power in the country is divided into three groups. The first is the legislature in the UK Parliament, comprising the House of Commons and the House of Laws. They make the laws subject to democratic control, election of the representatives or nomination by elected representatives. Second, the executive, in this case, the government and the prime minister who put these laws into effect and plan policy. The arm of the government that the tribunal in which I most often sit have dealings with is the Home Department, which deals with immigration control. The third grouping is the judiciary, and all of us as judges take an oath to administer justice by upholding the law, particularly when its meaning is in dispute and we have to decide what Parliament has meant. The idea is that each group should have its own separate role. The legislature making laws the executive putting laws into effect, and the judiciary interpreting and upholding the law when its meaning is in dispute. And the idea is that if all of those three roles were rolled up into one person, then our rights and freedoms would become limited. That's why the roles are seen to be needed as separate. Could you think of why it might be dangerous if my colleagues and I as judges could be influenced on the one hand by politicians or on the other hand, by powerful interest groups. There could be the risk that the rule of law, 
which is there partly to ensure that the law applies consistently to everyone, could be weakened. So what does a real judge do? The first thing to explain is that the work that we do as judges more often than not varies on a day-to-day -day basis and there really isn't a typical day. One day I can be going through paper files and for example uh, prioritising them and assigning them to fellow colleagues. Another day I might be doing a face-to-face -face hearing or in a, in a tribunal or in, or in a courtroom and another day the parties could be attending by video hearing. Each day there could be different parties coming along, each with their own case from every part of the world with different experiences and sometimes the most vulnerable people in society. They sadly include children without their parents and some people who may have been trafficked. And what I mean by that is those who may have been recruited by threats to be exploited. So here's an opportunity for a case for you to consider yourselves. Now here's a scenario I'm going to read out to you. So you're told that a person is caught working illegally in the UK and you have to decide where the public interest lies if they ask to stay in the UK on the basis of their human rights. Does the public interest lie in refusing them leave to remain or does it lie in them having to leave? You learn more facts. The person's work is in fact growing cannabis plants in an illegal cannabis farm. Where do you think that the same public interest now lies? Should it be allowing them to stay in the UK on the basis of their human rights or should they be asked to leave? You're told a final piece of information. The person is in fact 14 years old. They're a child. They have been sent to the UK following threats of violence back in their home country and are effectively being kept in the cannabis farm without any choice. They're scared of returning to their home country. Where do you think that the public interest lies now? Now I've given this as a real example because on the next slide I'm going to show you statistics that have been uh, provided by our own government. What you can see here is that those who are described as the victims of modern slavery, those who've been trafficked and are forced to work against their will, are one quarter where every fourth victim is a child. And in this country, the second most common form of criminal exploitation is illegal cannabis cultivation. And of the victims of modern slavery, 81% of those involved are children. On a slightly lighter note, I wanted also to talk to those of you who may be interested in a career in the law. Now, the important thing to say is that my job as a judge is just one of many, many jobs in the legal profession. I started off as a solicitor in a law firm and then went on to become a tribunal advocate speaking in courtrooms and also later as a lawyer employed by a large company whilst remaining a judge part time. There are also specialist lawyers, barristers who you may see wearing wigs or gowns, lawyers employed by the government, court ushers and legal clerks with whom hearings just wouldn't be able to take place, case officers who deal with all the paperwork, legal advisers including those working for legal advice centres and also those working in academia providing invaluable contributions to legal thought. And finally, uh, for example, voluntary legal roles such as being a magistrate. I appreciate it could sound daunting as to how you become a lawyer. Realistically, you can become a judge regardless of your background, but that doesn't mean that everyone can become a judge. You do need to get good grades at school. You should think about planning now, in particular, about how you could get work experience. You could do your own research go and listen to a case. Most cases are heard in public and you can go to your local court or tribunal hearing centre 
where you can watch a case live. Alternatively and increasingly, you can watch cases or listen to them live, or alternatively, many cases are now increasingly recorded via the internet so that you can watch those. If you're thinking about applying to study law at university, have a look at the Law National Aptitude Test. That's the test used by a number of leading universities. But also do bear in mind that a lot of lawyers didn't study law at university and you can still becoming, become a lawyer at a later stage. There are other things you could do in the future. For example, think about becoming a magistrate. You don't need to be a lawyer to be a magistrate. There are different routes to becoming a lawyer. So, for example, you could decide whether you want to be a solicitor, as I was, or a barrister, or a chartered legal executive. And that's particularly important for those of you who don't want to incur the expense of going to university. And the important point to mention here is that all three categories of those kinds of lawyers have gone on to become judges. Now, I mentioned earlier about the separation of powers and the importance of the independence of the judiciary. Now, a key part of that is the appointments process. In other words, how people become judges. In certain countries, the appointment of judge is the subject of a vote, either by members of the public or the legislature. But that's not how things are done in the UK. Judges have to be experienced lawyers. There is an independent body called the Judicial Appointments Commission. That appoints judges solely on merit. There's a, a, a detailed application process which has a demanding application form. So for those of you who are considering applying for university, you might be thinking about a form that requires great thought and the need to give specific examples. Having completed that form, you have to attend an interview. Uh, and at that interview, uh, your answers, uh, particularly around those examples, are discussed and you also carry out a role play. Uh, and you answer questions afterwards and following uh, background checks, you have to wait whilst uh, the merits of the different uh, candidates are assessed and weighed against one another. And after a period of time, eventually, uh, you're appointed as a judge. Now, I've mentioned all of that. The entire process is completely transparent and the Judicial Appointments Commission has its own website which sets out the criteria. So it's uh, never too young to start thinking about a legal career. Do think about it uh, now. Don't forget that uh, any citizen, provided it's a public hearing and the vast majority of hearings are public, any citizen can go in uh, and watch uh, a trial. One day you may become a juror. If you do want to find out more, look at the uh, judiciary website uh, and you can see the website on the slide. And also the judicial office has its own Instagram account as well, which you can see on the version of these slides. So I hope that's been uh, informative and thank you very much.